Here we are with the 22nd conversation in recent history with Peter Miller. I'm Guy McPherson, and today we're going to talk again about mental health and emotional responses to information that comes our way. And Peter had some questions he sent me, which I completely misinterpreted. And so we're going to start by Peter talking about some of those misconceptions. The part I missed when Peter sent it to me the first time was misconceptions. I, I thought people were having these conceptions about me. And so we went back and forth by email and I got all cranky. And well, in the end, here we are. So <laughs> Peter Miller, why don't you first tell us about your free course and then launch into what are we talking about anyway? For sure. Uh, so the free course that I offer uh, for mental health slash uh, specifically borderline personality disorder is located at freebpdcourse.com. Um, and um, so it is for uh, uh, a portion of the population, and, and meaning like millions and millions, uh, because about 6% of the population uh, is diagnosed 2 to 6%. Uh, hard to say exactly, is is diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which is a struggle with uh, regulating emotions and um, perception and getting kind of stuck in emotions and irrationality unintentionally uh, and then experiencing all kinds of unwanted uh, circumstances uh, and uh, unwanted outcomes, these kinds of things. I mean, that's it in a very brief nutshell. Um but I mean, today's talk with Guy has a lot to do with um, how we can misperceive and misinterpret things. Um, and along the way, I, th I think ever since you've been delivering your message, Guy, there's been this tendency uh, for people, I, like me included at times when I first started listening, to get caught up in some specific kinds of thought errors or misinterpretations about what you were trying to say about the subject. And so in the last couple of days, I was like, what specifically are these misconceptions and the ways that your message gets twisted, distorted, misinterpreted, and then and, and it probably contributes to things like, uh, you know, hating on Guy McPherson or defamation, these kinds of things, um, or scapegoating him for things that uh, are, doesn't make sense to do. So I I have a list of about eight specific types of thinking that I, I would like to just talk to you about and we can clarify these things and it's also going to be a good mental health exercise because then you can see how thing how humans sometimes more or less have the tendency to uh, misinterpret misperceive misconceive and kind of run with it uh, without fully thinking it through and sometimes it can lead to disastrous consequences uh in the ways people behave and the choices they make. And of course we want to prevent that, right? Absolutely. Some people misunderstand my message so badly that they commit suicide. And that's, that's not my point at all. And it never has been. And I'm certain if people would actually follow my advice, that at least one person I know would not have committed suicide because he was a very well-read, knowledgeable individual. And he, he I, I think he just didn't understand that the message here is to live every moment. The, the message here is that our time is short no matter how long we live. And therefore, we must live fully with intention. So, missed points, misconceptions, they're... they're flinging by me all the time <laughs> so let's i mean let's start at the top i mean these are probably very common uh, i'm just going to read them out word for word and when you're when you're trying to sort out thoughts I, i'll just kind of point out too it's good to like write out your thoughts like write out what you're thinking about a particular thing so that you can become more aware of your habits right and then as you become more aware you can make the adjustments when needed as well so anyway, so one of the thoughts that came to mind was I'm just going to read it here. To accept near-term human extinction as truth. Now, this is the mis misconception. To accept near-term human extinction as truth means that people now have permission 
or are encouraged to give up and not try to achieve things and to experience joy as circumstances allow. So, I mean, you were kind of talk speaking to that in your in your opening words there. Um, but right. like this, this happens, right? Right. Absolutely. People tell me all the time. So you're just saying to give up. So you're just saying we shouldn't do anything. So you're saying I should commit suicide. So you're saying I should drop out of, of, of all kinds of professional and social life. And no, 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 and no. That's going to be the key word today. <laughs> 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 is no, that is not the correct interpretation. Right. Um, so if we were to, I mean, and this is classic cognitive behavioral therapy. So if we were to put up a, 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 a more rational spin on the those types of words. So if you accept NTHE NTH as truth, um, so we're saying it, you don't, we're not offering permission or encouraging you to give up and to, uh, we're not encouraging you to not try to achieve things and to enjoy life as experience, as uh, circumstances allow. Uh, in fact, um, while, you know, while we're all here, I mean, I think you're saying let's make let's make the best of this experience as we possibly can, despite the challenges, despite the um, losses of biodiversity that do occur, despite the um, corporate agendas to continue their money making machine that has a cost to all of us that they won't acknowledge. So we're saying despite all of that uh, in bring something bring good things to the world and find the pockets of joy um seek that out don't give up on it and and there's no better way to bring joy your, to yourself than by bringing joy to somebody else <clears throat> so <clears throat> if you can help somebody even in some small way i guarantee that's going to help you from an emotional health standpoint it's not just helping the other person mm -hmm. Yeah, every time we talk and I'm able to share my contributions with the world, I mean, I feel I feel a warmth inside and it's just nice to know that it might help somebody somewhere or some family um, have a little bit less pain and misery. And um, I mean, you're saying you could extend, you could contribute in a multitude of ways. Uh, it could be taking out your neighbor's garbage. It could be a whole bunch of things, right? Like, Right. There was, when I was in Tucson, there was a woman whose very young son died tragically right in front of her. And for, for several weeks after that, when somebody would do something as simple as hold the door open for her, she would burst out into tears, tears of joy, because mm -hmm. she just didn't think life could be good anymore. Mm -hmm. Now that her son had died, I think he was four years old, and she just couldn't imagine that people could be good in the world. And so when somebody did something as simple as holding a door for her, she burst out into tears because this is so amazing, so much better than she thought humans could be. Maybe you can be that person who holds the door for somebody. Right. right? It's so totally in your power. Right. Yeah. There are these little, we, we think of them as little things, but maybe they're not so little after all giving somebody a compliment. Yeah, it can totally make your somebody's day. It can look, absolutely brighten their spirits and um uh gosh, give them the the uplift and energy they need to work through other challenging parts of life. Right. So, um so uh yeah, like even though, I mean, I guess we have to say that kind of like even though <laughs> things can be not great on the environmental front uh it doesn't it it doesn't mean that it all is lost so you, i guess what i'm going to emphasize today too is this all or nothing black or white tendency of thinking Absolutely. and this is this is a common tendency whether people have bpd or not right uh i think it's just a human thing people with borderline i think tend to they tend to struggle with that a bit more <laughs> until they become acutely aware of what's happening and then they can manage it uh, but people do it regularly. Right? Yeah, I, I think it's one of the parts of being human is is that we tend to seek binaryism. We yeah. tend to we tend to think us versus them. We tend to think black or white, yes or no, yeah. right? And so, 
yes, to over to, to oversimplify it to oversimplify things is to find a a pseudo security i would like a false sense of security right and, and people do it all the time right it's because they want to feel secure so they come up you know whether it's a church or they come up with some other oversimplification of things then it, they feel safe but it's not it's not grounded in rational thought right and and that's the easy way out by the way you, you know I, th I think that's why we evolved to have this binary thinking is because that's the easy way out to create the situation of us them of me you of everything is black or white mm -hmm. that that makes it easier to carry on that's right uh i couldn't i couldn't agree more and um just because it feels good for things to be oversimplified and made you know <laughs> easier than it should be doesn't mean it's the the ethical or moral way to go <laughs> okay so let's go with statement number two here uh to accept nthe as truth means that people now have permission or encouraged to recklessly indulge and use up their available resources since earth's hospital day, hospitable days are very few hmm. so this kind of goes with the other statement but i mean so people can be like oh well now i'm just gonna like now i'm gonna blow my whole Right. Party oh, like I'm, it's 1999. Right? I'm, just, I'm just gonna, you know, we only got a week or two left. So I you know, like, like that's the where, but uh, that's the something where that's something people can, can might conclude. So what, what do we say about that kind of recklessness? Yeah, again, nuance is, is difficult for humans. It seems uh, again, it's yes, no, it's me, them. Right. But, but here we have nuance. We don't know when we're going to die. I don't know when you're going to die. I don't know when I'm going to die. I wish everybody had their death date stamped on their forehead so that people could see it when you meet them at a party, right? So if, if you had the day after tomorrow stamped on your head, then I know that maybe I shouldn't invest much time in making you a partner in my business enterprise. Right. But on the other hand, I might reach out to you. And by the way, if this is going to work, then we can't see our own. Right, we can't see our own death date. Only everybody else. Knows. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Right, so we don't know, but everybody else does. Maybe everybody would be kinder to the people who who are going to die the day after tomorrow, or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So far, I haven't worked this out with the powers that be to make this happen. But <laughs> and and that you know that's why I have my bangs here in front, so people couldn't see it even if they wanted to. So the reinterpretation is like no, right? There's that key word again. <laughs> no, don't don't be reckless with your available resources. Um, like wait for you know wait for more information like to accumulate. Um, like I, I think with what you've been saying over the years, guys, we're on a certain path. It's not a great path. It's uh, it's the killer path, kind of right. It's a that's where that's the direction we're headed. Um, and it's, 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 it's the projection according to the scientific data, right? It's, um, and, and not only that, but sometimes the scientific information is wrong. There was a paper in one of the most renowned journals there is. How renowned is it? It comes out once a year, typically early in the year. And it's the annual review of earth and planetary sciences in 2012, a paper called The Future of Arctic Sea Ice indicated that we would lose Arctic sea ice in 2016, plus or minus three years. And when we do lose Arctic sea ice, that will set us on a trajectory that almost certainly will include extinction of humans and most, if not all, other organisms on the planet. So it's a really bad deal. It's, it's the worst of all possible news. Now, the same research team that published that paper, by the way, we didn't have an ice free Arctic in 2016, plus or minus three years. So the latest date would have been 2019. And look at us, we're four years after that. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's a long time. And mm -hmm. this is something that cost me a lot of mm, veracity, um, trust from other people, is that I relied upon that paper to indicate when we're going to go extinct. Well, the paper was wrong, as it turns out. Now, the same, the, a similar research team, also at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, headed by the same 
person who directed the previous effort. Now they have put together a six-month ensemble forecast, which from a scientific standpoint is very conservative. So I think we will know with great certainty in early to mid-April of this year, based on their six-month ensemble forecast, when we're going to have an ice-free Arctic Ocean. But, but their latest projection, no, these are predictions. They're, they're forecasts. They're not projections like they used previously. And so far in the, I think it's two or three years that they've been doing these ensemble forecasts, we haven't come close to an ice-free Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So... So I, I mean, s science is better than than haphazard thinking, <laughs> like, but it's still not perfect, a hundred percent perfect. Exactly, and they used uh, what turned out to be an inappropriate projection. You know, they used the existing data points, say they're just clouded data points, and then they ran a a line through them, and where it hit bottom was twenty sixteen plus or minus three years, and it turned out that was wrong. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> right? Right, right. Um, and like, is there ever a time to become totally reckless with our resources? I mean, I'm kind of thinking, like, if, if, I, if I really care about the people around me, and I want to support them in their life as long as possible, right, I'm not going to become, I'm not just going to recklessly blow it all, or even if it's just me, I mean, if and if there's good things I can bring to the world, why should I recklessly uh, uh, destroy what I have to support my own life and then undermine what I could give to others? I mean, if you really want to think about morality, I mean, think about that, right? Like, um, right. Is, is it ever a good plan <laughs> to party like it's 1999? I right. don't know. Right. No, I, I, I can't imagine a situation in which that would be the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess what I'll add along the way here too, like because emotions can be difficult to deal with and because guys' messages can be emotionally evocative, it can induce a sense of fear. Um, that's one of the reasons I think people get stuck in the polarized thinking, right? Is they kind of get caught up in their emotion. They don't have a way to manage it effectively. And then they end up in kind of these extreme ways of thinking. And I've said this before, like, if you want to explore guys' content, I think you should get some some awareness and skill about how to work with emotion so you don't end up in those <laughs> extreme places, right? Uh, you sort of have to take it upon yourself to, like, okay, this is this is this this can be emotionally evocative, and so I'm going to learn how to work with this part of my health so I don't become reckless, right? <laughs> Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, I can't imagine a situation in which reckless behavior is a good idea. I and, mean, and when you're we, not only when hurting we, yourself, you're potentially hurting other people. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and when we struggle with our emotions, unfortunately, it's more likely. Uh, when we don't have a good way to manage those emotions, it's more likely that we could have extreme thinking and extreme behavior. Okay, so statement number three here. Uh, accepting NTHE as truth. This is a misconception means that suicide is preferable to facing whatever is in store. So some people might say, I'd rather die than wait for like apocalyptic circumstances. Right. I'd uh, rather die at my own hand than face whatever is coming next. Like, yeah. a, like then, yeah, starve or whatever, right? Right. And how, how could that possibly be sane? As nearly as we can tell, this is a one-way street. There is only one life we have here, and it's short. By any measure, our lives are short. And so you're gonna you're gonna end that one life that you have that that you claimed you were trying to make better every day, right? Mm. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. and again, you said the word "easy way out." Those words, right? And um, uh. If you're if you're saying I would rather not face challenging circumstances, then I would rather die than face challenging circumstances, right? It's kind of saying I don't want to be faced with, I don't want to have to experience hardship, and uh, and I guess you're also saying when you say that I don't want to help others through that time, right? I want to 
I want, I'm going to bail so that I don't, I'm not around. And then if people need me, I won't be there for them. Right. Uh, I, I think suicide has got to be the most selfish thing, the most selfish act a person can commit. Because it's not just about you. There are people in your life. There, there might be family members, there might be friends there, but I've never known anybody who could who, who committed suicide who wasn't missed. Yeah. Like I have a I have an I have sort of an under, I have an understanding of where those people can be coming from, especially if they don't haven't yet learned enough about mental health and how to manage it. I I can I can fathom how it would seem like life is too much to carry on. Um but the thing is there are resources, there are ways to learn how to live in your body differently so that you can endure those experiences, right? So, I mean, and these resources are freely available, right? And and we're just, I'm just we're just giving them to you. <laughs> it's like, like my resource is one of many, but there are other, other free or relatively inexpensive resources and you can learn how to do this, right? Um, so that suicide doesn't have to be the way or the only option. And I mean, if that's something that runs through your mind regularly, like I want to escape life because the emotions are too hard, get some skills, right? Learn right. some things. And then it, it becomes just, it doesn't have to be the only way to to cope. So again, yeah. we're saying we're saying no to suicide, are we not? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Life is difficult. Life is difficult for everybody, right? I mean, I don't know anybody who breezes through life I don't, I don't even think the queen or the king of England, right? I, I, I suspect that even they have difficult days, even when they have people wiping their butts every time they... <laughs> well, privilege doesn't privilege doesn't eliminate mental health challenges. Uh, right. I'll t tell you that. I know that 100%, because I've met with people of all stripes, and it's whether you're poor or rich, you can still experience horrendous emotional pain. Okay. So let's go to statement four. To accept MTHE as truth means that people should conclude there could never, ever be a global response that resolves the McPherson paradox. Um, when the McPherson paradox, which is the global warming and aerosol masking effect put together, right? That's the McPherson paradox. Yes. Which basically, which basically it sounds like um, there's no way ever, ever, ever to address this issue. And I mean, with what we have for information now, it seems to be the case. Um, uh, I, I, and I and I'm going to ask you about one of my favorite authors today, a book reference. Um, and maybe we could talk about this for a minute. Um, but if there was a global response, and if people suddenly were able to give up their egos and their superiority and their and their demands for privilege, and we actually gave a shit about each other as a globe. <laughs> Uh, I mean, do you hear what I'm saying? Like, is it, um, yeah, are we saying that a, you're probably oh, yeah. a lot of what ifs here? <laughs> I mean, are we saying people should never conceive of a resolution when, when you deliver your message? Are you saying don't even imagine a resolution to the McPherson paradox? Cause it's not possible. <laughs> are, you, are you saying that? No, of course not. And, and furthermore, listen, we know our lives are short. When I was touring Western Europe in 2015, the world's oldest human being at the time turned 117 years old. And when she was asked, what it, at her at her 117th birthday party, she was asked, "What's what's that like? You know, you're 117. Has it been a good run? How's that been working out for you?" She said, and I quote, "It seemed rather short." She was 117. Yeah. Now, essentially, none of us are going to make it to 117. And I promise it will feel rather short. Mm -hmm. When you get to the end of the line, I don't think anybody is going to be going, oh, man, it's about time. 48 years was <laughs> nonsense. Like, I hear you. Like, life is short. We're all, I mean, we all have to face the, the fact of death regardless of when it happens, n nearer or later, right? Near or far. Uh, I guess what, uh, when you're, you're not saying that people shouldn't toy with the idea, 
how could we resolve the McPherson paradox? It's kind of fun, actually. Like, I, 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 right. I kind of, uh, I, I like to imagine scenarios. Like, you know, what would it take to resolve the McPherson paradox? Right? It would. I, I think it would take a huge global response. It would take cooperation, unparalleled cooperation. Um, it would take the dropping of like nationality and egos like never before. Right. Um, I, I don't view it as moon as a moonshot. I view it as a Pluto shot, right? That's that's how challenging this would be. But it will never happen if we don't all agree that we're facing a huge problem here and therefore make some sacrifices so that we can address the issue. What and, am I... Uh, go ahead. If you're, if, you're, if you're not willing to make some small sacrifice so that we can continue to have life on Earth then I don't think we're on the same page. I suspect most people are willing to make some sacrifices to ensure the continuation of life on Earth, including human life. And yeah, when we say sacrifices, I think we should elaborate on that. And I'm just going to bring in this book reference here. Um, one of my favorite characters, he's deceased now, Jack Fresco. He has this book called The Best That Money Can't Buy, Beyond Politics, Poverty and War. He was a uh, founder of the Venus Project or one of the leaders oh. there. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And he's he writes eloquently about exactly what we're talking about. And um, uh, like I think what it would really take, like if we were to even have a chance at resolving the McPherson paradox, it would take like in what he writes in his book is what I'm referencing here, sort of. And if I can, he would say it would it would be like a, a complete paradigm shift. Like everything that we've ever done would have to be discarded. We'd have to, we'd have to, we'd have to tabulate and tally everything that we have for resources everywhere in the world. And then we would have to scientifically, what that's the the best method that we have to figure out, you know, how we can deploy these resources um evenly uh to every everyone everywhere. Uh so basically like re restructuring. The whole damn thing from bottom up like it would mean letting go of religion it would mean l dropping your ego it would mean l forgetting about nationality like we're all one we're all on this ship i don't have you ever seen the movie alive it's like this these um it's a soccer team in the 1970s they got trapped in the andes their oh, plane yeah. went down their plane went down and um they were trapped in the freezing cold in this in the wreckage of this plane Mm -hmm. And they had to figure out, like, okay, they had, to, they had to consider, what do we have, like, for anything that's in the suitcases, right, for, like, food and supplies, what do we have from the plane that we can use, and suddenly it was all selfishness was, like, gone, right, and then they had to figure out, how are we just going to get through one more day with what we have, I, and I think that's the kind, that's the level of peril that people need to be in before they're ready to think in those ways, Um and yes, that, we're, we're not there. We're not in that kind of peril just yet. <laughs> right. And what that means is people have to be willing to face their own death. So we have to start there. Right. I mean, who does that? In my family, we never even talked about the idea. When I was growing up, it was as if, as if death didn't even exist. Well, it does, folks. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> dies. If, if And I try to live accordingly that knowing i try to live with death in mind knowing that any day might be my last and so that allows me to live with urgency it does not allow me to squander everything i have mm -hmm. right because if i if i really accept that today is my last day on earth then i might go buy a bunch more ice cream than i really should eat <laughs> thereby ensuring that today is my last day Right, right, right. So we, so, so it's a balancing act. This whole thing of life on Earth is a balancing act, and it applies to us as individuals as well. Of course, and um, and so like the message isn't that hey, people don't even imagine a future, like don't even imagine future possibilities, don't even read Jack Fresco's book, right? Like, I don't think you're saying that when you're saying that this is the path that we're on. Uh, you're not discouraging a new paradigm, are you? 
No, I'm encouraging people to live fully, recognizing that your life is going to be relatively short. However, that does not mean taking from other people. It it does not mean living immorally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That and and that morality need not be rooted in religion. There are plenty of decent ways to live that have nothing to do with religion. I mean, and if people actually humbled themselves to nature in the way that Jack Fresco was kind of mm -hmm. talking about, mm -hmm. if they were like, okay, we're going to drop our ego. We're going to drop our belief systems, our traditions. We're actually going to work together for, for friggin' once. Right? <laughs> like, and we're going to actually design a system that supports everybody. And as actually is not abusing the earth is actually working with her. Right. Um, like you would, I'm guessing you would be open to that. Like you wouldn't, dis you wouldn't discourage it. Of course, because <laughs> even listen, what better measure of our character than to act in a certain positive way to the planet and other people knowing that we're going to die. Right. So what if we're all going to die that for me, that does not remove the possibility of living ethically of living morally, of living decently to other people and to other organisms. Um, if we were, if we were going to die anyway, I think it would be the best way to go out. Like if we had a collective response at the end where we said, I'm sorry, I was such a psychopath, right? Like, I'm sorry, you know, that I, I, I tried to plunder the earth at your expense just so I could have more, right? Like, I'm sorry that I didn't work together. I'm sorry that I abused Mother Earth so bad. Like if we could do that at the end, that that would be, even if it didn't work, right? Like that would be the that would be nice. Yes, one of the best examples I've ever seen. I might have talked about it with you before. Is in Key West. Key West every day at sundown, everybody in Key West gathers on the beach to watch the sun go down. We have that shared experience. Now, it's a beautiful place to start with, and it almost never rains, obviously. You wouldn't be watching the sun go down. But all that aside, we're coming together as a human community of a few thousand people to share this experience. So we know we're capable at the level of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. So we can extend mm -hmm. that to the way we live every day, every moment. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, again, I think it would be, it would take, in, it would take uh, circumstances unimaginable to bring people to like, quote unquote, to their knees that way, <laughs> to their knees before the earth, right? Like, um, people are so steeped in their traditions and their beliefs and their egos and their nationalities and their presumed um, superiority right? Like, uh, they're so steeped in it. Like, it's almost like they need to be on that plane that went down in the Andes. They need to have that experience in order to have that humility. And some, if it's possible that we could get to that point, and if it, if we could still use the resources we have to, to make amends, or at least try, I mean, again, that would be, that would be a sight, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it would. Because like Key West is a sight. Key West yeah. is like every sundown. It's amazing to, to actually observe people gathering together to have this shared experience. It's amazing. And it's only amazing because it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen anywhere else at any time, as nearly as I can tell. This, yeah, that would this, be amazing. The feeling together better. of the human community is incredible. That would be something to experience. Um, the other part here was, um, I think this happens, um, misconception. To accept NTHE as truth means that people should feel shame for having taken part in industrial civilization and making the problem worse. <clears throat> like, uh, I've, I think I've definitely felt that sense. Um, and I've definitely questioned my whole lifestyle, my whole, how I've lived my whole life in this way. And kind of realizing after the fact that, wow, you know, I was part of this damage. Um, but then at the same time, you have to ask yourself, how much shame should I feel for 
having no being raised in this, not knowing any other way. Um, and gosh, and then also realizing from the things that you say, um, it's not like so easy to just go off grid and it's not like it makes me very much change. I mean, you tried it, nobody followed, so it doesn't make a big difference anyway. So how much shame should we feel? None. Absolutely <laughs> zero. <laughs> you know, very frequently because of aerosol masking and its mere existence and because we don't have any control over what almost anybody does, you know, unless you're a parent or a spouse or a partner, you don't have any control over what anybody does. Right. So certainly we don't have control over the billionaires. So That's what it. I say is the mass of us, the, the the masses of humanity are here to conserve natural resources, to conserve all the things we need to have a decent existence for an extended period of time. And the billionaires are here to conserve aerosol masking. To so, preserve, to, pre to preserve privilege, I guess. Right. right. And so I don't have any control over that that rich man who the billionaire who flies not two jets but not just one personal jet but two personal jets whenever he goes right. somewhere the, the one in the lead to make sure that the one he's in behind doesn't experience any air pockets well i don't have any control over that i could write him letters till the cows come home so to speak and he would still take two jets every time he went somewhere and so I don't, I, all I need to do is make a joke out of it that I'm here to conserve and he's here to, to maintain aerosol masking. Right. So, I, I mean, most individuals, I think we should probably point out, most of us have a very small lever when it comes to like how much carbon we emit, like on, on the scale of things, right? We're probably in the very, very, very small percentage. And then people with the most privilege and all the factories and all the thing, extra things that they do, they have golf courses whatever like they have a much bigger lever, lever and they waste more right like right absolutely uh, <laughs> they emit more um so we have the small lever we have very limited control over carbon emissions and and there's a whole bunch of other things that matter too you know it's not just carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that that we need to be concerned about it's yeah. everything how much plutonium did you use last year how much of everything so and but, like you say we don't have a large lever right i think it still makes sense to feel some way and i've said this to you before like i don't think we need to get like buried in shame but i still think it makes sense to feel some sadness some regret some disappointment that this is the way it is and this is you know this is what's happening you know, and that we got sucked into it. It's still kind of sad. Yes. Right? And it's, it's, it's unbelievably sad. And we have no control over it. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I feel terrible. And, and as with every generation, I think this is an every generation kind of thing. I blame the generation before me and the generations after me blame me. Right. <laughs> right. And it's it's a lot more complicated than that. It's a lot more nuanced than that, folks. But we we just don't do nuance well. And it's good to admit that. Right? <laughs> so it's good to admit that. And I mean, if we can say to ourselves, you know, I don't do nuance well, and I don't have a very good grasp on the very big picture. So everything that I conclude, I really have to say, like with a with a grain of salt. Like I can't say this is totally the way it is. Like it's. You can't be 100% certain even after listening to 200 Guy McPherson videos, right? Like, <laughs> you, still, you can't have 100% certainty. I thought I was pretty darn certain when I when I walked away from from civilized life that and started living off grid. I thought I had it all figured out. Turned out I was wrong. And I, 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 when you say wrong, I think it's in degrees because I, I think the scientific method is still reliable. It just it can be in percentages, percentage points. Uh, right. That's... But but I didn't know anything about the aerosol masking effect, the best right. kept okay. in climate science. So uh, lacking information, 
I went down a certain path that seemed like a good idea at the time. And I think that speaks volumes to your character to admit that and to say, like, like, look, I didn't know everything. I based my conclusions on what I know at the time. And so, I mean, that's that's a humble thing for a very educated man to say, <laughs> I think. So I appreciate that. Um, so that the second last one here, to accept NTHE as truth means that our attitude towards humans should be generally negative because they have proven themselves to be more selfish and ruinous than conscientious and moral. It's like, should we hate humans? <laughs> right? That would be a very extreme way of thinking, right? Like, are we yes. all bad kind of thing? Yes, we should, hate, we should hate all of them except for our personal friends and the occasional <laughs> person we have a Zoom meeting with. <laughs> no, no, that doesn't make any sense because just like you, just like me, everybody is trying to get along to the best of their abilities. They're living within this set of living arrangements that they had no control over. This is what was operating when I came into the world. It's still operating. It's still charging along. And I don't have any control over it. I dropped out. So what? Didn't change a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and there are writers who make decent money by shaming people. By telling people that you got to do less. Here's what I do. I wash my own clothes in a bucket, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Come on. Yeah. And this can be a really destructive path to get on, even towards yourself, I think. So if you like start developing a hate on for all of humanity, I think you could easily turn that on yourself, right? And then then you would want to die kind of thing. Like, I'm such right. a horrible, I'm such a horrible organism, right? Like I'm I'm such an awful being <laughs> and I'm and I'm in a system that is harmful. And like you could you got to be careful, like, you know, like with the the profound negativity, because um, humans are not all bad. We do we do pro-social things. We do things that many of us try and do things that are helpful. I mean, I think you're looking at one of them. <laughs> I, I try. I still make lots of mistakes, but geez, it's not all bad. You know, right. and I think I think Guy McPherson is the same. You know, well, there's there's this group led by somebody who won't give his real name on YouTube. And the group is called Ethelism or Ethelists. And Ethel, E-F-I-L, is life spelled backwards. And they are opposed to any life at all. And an acquaintance of mine fell for that nonsense. He committed suicide. That's absurd. It's absolutely ridiculous. Because there's this idiot on YouTube who's telling people that we got to not only kill ourselves, we got to get rid of all life on Earth. Hey, buddy, we're headed that way already. You don't need to encourage people to shorten their lives and the lives of other people just because of your screwed up thoughts. And you don't even admit, admit who you are. Wow. Oh. So that, again, that is called ethelism. Or is that what I was wondering if that would come up today. That's called. How do you say that again? Ethelism. And and the people are called ethelists. So it's yeah, it's basically saying any life form, or especially a human life form, is is a bad life form. Yes, uh, absolutely. And all like, life, it... all life is bad. Okay, are you uh, kidding me? It's a very a very extreme, distorted way of looking at things. Like oh, it's, it's saying it's all it's all negative. There's no nuance. There's no gray. There's no there's no yes and no. There's it's all binary. One hundred percent binary. Right. right. <laughs> and and whoever believes that never tasted a fresh strawberry <laughs> <laughs> or or acknowledges the good things that they have uh, offered you know like um right um i think most people do some nice things and they try their best with what they have i i like to give people the benefit of the doubt i mean i think it's and i think it's a reasonable thing to do most people have experienced love. That's an amazing experience. To, to claim that we should all kill ourselves and all the rest of life on earth, to negate not just every other experience, but to negate falling in love, that alone is enough to make me want to do bad things to this individual <laughs> who doesn't give his name. <laughs> and that's putting it mildly.
Yeah, it's well, it's so frustrating to know that that philosophy exists, I guess, right? And that that kind of philosophy can bring so much harm to the world and unnecessary harm, irrational harm, right? Right. And notice there's no evilists out there, anti-love people who are who want the opposite of love. I guess it would be evil evilists. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. The, the frustration with things can be really hard. Okay, the last one. Um, to accept NTHG as truth means that it's more appropriate to think in extreme ways rather than balanced and nuanced ways because we're in an extreme situation environmentally. So just because we're in a, a kind of an extreme situation, according to the revealed information and scientific data, it doesn't look great. Uh, our lives, our livelihoods and life do seem to be on the line with this information. Does that mean we should think in extreme ways? No, it, it means we should appreciate every moment that much more. That we don't know how long we have. And I know I've said this a thousand times with you, but because we don't know how much time we have, we must live with urgency. We must live as though our lives are short because we know they are. The 117-year-old woman that I talked about died just a few weeks after she said it seemed rather short. You know, she was putting a punctuation mark on her message that life is short. Yes, it is. And maybe we should add to urgency. We should add with care, like with conscientiousness, right? Like with, um, with, uh, huh with rationality like there's it's a it's a kind of a package right right uh, that needs to be i think considered uh I, I think if people take urgency too far they could be like i gotta waste all my resources right if they say it's all urgent right <laughs> they because then they could be missing another a, a few components absolutely to, to staying sensible um sensibility is kind of at the bottom line of all this isn't it like it's 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 hard information to swallow there can be hard feelings to feel, but we we don't want to lose our sensibility in the process, which what is what seems to happen. And like you said, with some of these emerging philosophies that are just seem like extremely harmful and dangerous. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Life is difficult, right? So I think we all agree about that. <laughs> that doesn't mean we have to make it difficult for ourselves or for other people. It's already oh, it's already tough enough, or yeah, harder than it needs to be. I, that's one of the things I say. Right, <laughs> life right. is already hard. We don't need to make it harder than it needs to be. And, right. Um, so, I, I think for today, yeah, I just really wanted to go on the record with you about how to, you know, specifically some of the thoughts that need correcting. Right. Um, well, I appreciate that, and I'm sorry I lashed out at you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> misinterpreted was, what you're trying to get to. I was pretty, pretty, pretty small lashing. It's okay. <laughs> I need to work on it. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no. Well, you <laughs> caught it. You hey, you you caught it. You caught it. Uh, so, like, um, yeah. And again, uh, I have a resource that you can utilize at freebpdcourse.com if you want to learn like everything I've learned about my own mental health and everything, you know, how I, how I pulled it all together kind of in a, a formula, so to speak about how to deal with mental health issues, specifically borderline personality disorder, but it also could apply easily to any depression or anxiety disorder. Um, uh, that's, that's great. I, for one, appreciate what you're doing here in offering that course free. This is a, another indication of your commitment to service to other human beings. Well, it feels good to contribute. And um, uh, that's part of being, that's part of being human, I think, you know, and to, to demonstrate that we're not entirely ego driven, selfish beings and people who have suffered a lot. I think they want, they don't want, they want people to suffer less. <laughs> uh, well, ask any, I, I'm sure if you ask anyone who suffered with BBT with BPD, they'd be like, I don't want anyone to deal with that. It sucks. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, let's wrap it up right there and leave us some things to talk about next week.